Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And thank you for being here on the after lunch slot on day two of a conference. This is pretty good turnout, I have to say. So I will make sure that we keep this upbeat and lively, keep you guys awake. My name is Neil Cushel. We've got a fantastic panel today, and I'm really quite excited to talk to you uh, about how uh, brands can really supercharge their overall sales by focusing on B2B and wholesale and doing that through your, your direct to consumer e-commerce store. We've got a really exciting panel today, mixed of both technology and, if I may say, Alex, you'll forgive me, more importantly, actual retailers who have gone through real life issues. So maybe first of all, I'll start by introducing myself as Neil Cushel. Uh, I am a non-exec director at Sparklayer, but my, my real life career was, I, I was the CEO of Globally, a NASDAQ listed direct to consumer technology platform that helps brands do all of the cross border localization. So I've spent the last seven years embedded in e-commerce, helping direct to consumer brands sell internationally. And five to seven years ago, cross border was the exciting piece of technology for direct to consumer brands. And it's now grown significantly. And I actually think now the next forefront of that technology is B2B and wholesale, uh, because there's a real opportunity for brands to supercharge their revenue and profit it by doing it properly. But let's start by, by introducing the panel. So if I could start with Chris, would you like to give yourself a, a quick introduction? Sure. Hi, I'm Chris. I'm uh, the motorsports e-com manager for Castor. So I manage five, six D2C websites, and then this B2B website falls on my remit as well. So that's a B2B platform that we've got one brand on there, and then we'll start building that out into next year, putting the next two, three motorsports partners on there. Fantastic, and Sophie? Hi, I'm Sophie. I work for Asmodee. We're the UK's largest distributor of board games and car games, and I manage our e-commerce and digital marketing activity. Fantastic, and finally, Alex. Hi, I'm Alex. Uh, as Neil said, I'm the least important, but still get to introduce myself. Um, I'm the sales director at Sparklayer B2B, uh, which is a B2B platform for uh, e-commerce merchants. So let's start off, uh, Chris, you're nearest to me, so we'll start with you. So Castor, phenomenal brand, done so well over the last couple of years, working with lots of different sub-brands, as it were. You're looking after the McLaren part. Yep. Tell us a little bit about uh, McLaren's journey from B2C and direct to consumer, and now why B2B is an important part of the, of the growth journey. Yes, yeah, so McLaren's quite a unique one in that we're not selling B2B to retailers, we're actually selling it to McLaren dealers, so the supercar dealers. Um, they use these products for uh, marketing events, giveaways. Um, they previously had a platform with another provider where they were going through the parts, like the spare parts ordering program, which was like really old Excel spreadsheets and just didn't work for them. So we came along, took over their D2C sites and it's, hey, we've also got a B2B website that we can help use that. Um, and as, as their needs grew, as that business grew, we just realized that our current B2B platform just didn't do what we needed to do and it wasn't good enough for the customers either. So. And what kind of challenges is it causing you internally as a, as a business? Um, so before moving to Sparklayer, some of the challenges we had were customers not being able to pay by invoice. That, that was really the biggest challenge we had. Um, card payments were fine, but being able to raise an invoice and then us to be able to track that through our other platforms and you know, make the numbers match on Shopify and in our backends as well and then the customer happy with that last number. That was our biggest challenge initially, was making sure that invoice functionality was working correctly. Right. And so, Sophie, if I come on to you at Asmodee, uh, it's quite possible some of, the, uh, some of the people here haven't heard of Asmodee, but they will have heard of the, the, the brands that, and things that you're selling. Why don't you tell us a little bit about Asmodee and the challenges that you guys have had in B2B and what, how you operate it? Yep, so the biggest brand we work with is Pokemon. So we are the distributor for Pokemon cards in the UK. And uh, as you can imagine, they're in high demand. And we also work with uh, 
ordering our games like Double, Catan, Ticket to Ride, and things like that. So half of our retailer base are nationals, so Asda, Amazon, Waterstone, that sort of thing. And then the other half are hobby retailers. So some of these people have come into it because they love board games, and they're just a one-man band, little shop and others have five warehouses and have really scaled up into a big business. So we deal with such a broad range of retailers that we had to find something that works for all of them and also to understand their needs and be able to like adapt around it, work for credit customers, pro forma, everything like that. Uh, and what were the main challenges that Asmodee have been facing in terms of managing B2B over the past few years? So mostly during COVID it was amazing but the growth of the business we just couldn't keep up with it we can't keep up with it in terms of taking orders quickly enough so the inventory in the warehouse was going really like changing very rapidly and so people were having to call up an account handler just to find out stock levels things like that you want to be able to like we B2B customers have a higher expectation now of what you want to receive from your distributor or uh, shop sort of thing so um yeah, it was inventory mostly, and also just being able to log on at any time of day and not be limited to the nine till five, placing orders by phone calls and spreadsheets. Mm. And if, if I relate back to my old job at, at Globally, so Globally's got about 1,500 direct-to-consumer retailers using them for cross-border. And I would say in at least 10 to 15% of those sales conversations, brands would go, at some point, we're gonna. We're doing B two B. We're doing a bit of it. We don't. We're not even. We're not even trying to do it. But we get people calling us up, going, "I want to buy your stuff. I'd like to stock some of your things, but I can't do it on the website. How do I do it? Is there an order processing thing?" And it and it, it increasingly became a topic of conversation that heads of ecom who were dealing with direct to consumer were finding they were becoming accidental. B2B and wholesale sellers because people were contacting them through the sales at the info at in order to try to, to generate stuff. So as you can probably tell, Sparklayer have got some interest in this area. And so Sparklayer uh, uh, is headed up in terms of the sales for, by Alex. And I wonder, Alex, maybe you can give everybody a little bit of an overview of where Sparklayer came from, how did it come about, and what is its, uh, its mission? Yeah. Um so Sparklayer is actually born out of an existing uh, e-commerce platform that was based in the UK. Um, and the decision was made to move all of the customers from that e-commerce platform to Shopify. Uh, but they still wanted to have the B2B functionality that existed on that, at that platform that they had before. Um, so they carved out the piece of the platform that, that was worked for B2B um, and turned it into Sparklayer. And since then, uh, what we found is that this is a problem that lots of uh, retailers across uh, across the e-commerce space are really struggling with is how to do B2B online, how to add that functionality to their e-commerce store. Um, so we've had some really rapid growth in terms of new merchants that we've been working with, uh, but on a mission basically to make it easy for people to sell wholesale, bulk order, a specific price list and things like that um, online and make it a 24-7 service that they can offer basically. So in, in just over a year, Sparkplay has gone from having built a Shopify app to allow a set bunch of customers they were migrating to be able to do B2B, to having a thousand retailers using it. Yeah. You've spent the last few months speaking to a bunch of those. What are the kind of things they're telling you? Um, I think there's a, a variety of different learnings really that, that I've seen across all of our customers. Um, mostly I think it's that they're seeing a massive change in the expectations of what people want to be able to do when buying B2B online. They're looking for a really similar experience to what is on the direct to consumer side. They want to replicate as much as that B2C experience, um, but in a B2B scenario. The trouble that a lot of people have is that it's very complex. Um, you've got different price lists, you've got different ways of paying. Um, you might have account information that you have to hold for each of those customers. It makes it really difficult to be able to add all of those bits of functionality in, but still do it in a way that makes it easy for someone to use the website. So, People have been moving to really easy to use platforms like Shopify or BigCommerce or other platform insert here, um, but they haven't been able to access all of that B2B functionality because it's, it's so complex behind the scenes. Um, and I think the thing that a lot of uh, merchants have really struggled with is the ability to just add that in in an easy way that's easy to consume um, without really upsetting some of the existing business processes that happen behind the scenes as well. 
Um, and I think the guys here today are going to talk a little bit about some of the change management that they've had to go through with regards to putting some of these systems in place. Um, that's, that's a massive process that some merchants have to go through in order to change the way they're doing B2B today. And you were telling me earlier that, that it feels like brands were sort of falling into three categories. Yeah, uh, exactly, yeah. There's, there's really main three categories or three options that people have when they're thinking about going B2B. Um, it tends to be that they could stay in a manual process and, and continue to take phone orders or Excel sheets or manage it that way. Um, there's a specific B2B platforms that they could go down and they could have it as a completely separate store. It could be expensive, it could, it's a route that people go down there if they need like, really sp specific functionality and something more sophisticated. Um, or you can use something like Sparkler to add that, in, that infrastructure into your existing website that you've got for, for direct to consumer. And that's a route that more and more people are going down because it makes a lot of sense to have it all in one place. So let's now bring up to the current. And Chris, you've recently uh, implemented Sparkler. Tell us a little bit about what you've decided to do and how you've decided to build it and where you are in that journey. Yeah, so I think we initially chose Sparklayer because of its invoice functionality and then we soon saw that it had a whole host of other um, features that we were naturally going to want to start adding to the platform. Um, what's unique about Cast Store is we've got 26 other websites all on the Shopify platform. This is our only one B2B site. So dev resource is really limited that we can allocate to that. So what we've found with Sparklayer is it has the features that would take us months to get into our own dev pipeline. They're out of the box ready. That was the first thing that got us over the line and got us installed in the app and, and going through the process. Um, but then you've got your dev roadmap as well. So talking to you guys today, there's already features that you've got coming out in the future that we're, we're naturally going to want to add. So we don't have to run that through our dev pipeline. Uh, that's naturally coming uh, through Sparklayer. So did you decide to implement Sparklayer on an existing D2C site or create a new one with Sparklayer on it? So we had an existing B2B website. It was a standalone site that was supposed to do B2B. It didn't really do much. We sort of revived it and put the McLaren uh, customers on there start to improve it but realize that it sort of lacked functionality so just everything we wanted to do it did just it didn't do anything very well and then we were able to add spark layer on it and all those functions that you know we thought it was doing well did even better with with spark layer on there it's just it's a much easier journey customers can add items in bulk um, and that the accounts profile in there C customers love being able to go back and see their previous invoices and you know double check on what they've done in the past there. So it's just been really good having like a self-service platform for those customers. Mm. And Sophie, how did, how did Asmodee decide to crack this, the problem? So it's not the first time that B2B e-commerce has been attempted at Asmodee and we made the decision to re-platform onto Shopify two years ago because then you become part of that platform with lots of different apps and developers and that sort of thing. So we re-platformed over to Shopify so that you don't have to have a huge amount of uh, technical knowledge to be able to put images online and make collections and stuff like that. So the next step was how do we make it B2B? So Sparkler were recommended to us and previous to that our website was more of just a nice catalogue where you can look at the pictures, see what weight the products are and things like that, but you couldn't transact with it in any way. And so we thought we've put all of this work into, because we have thousands of products, we wanted to see how we can take that work that we've already done to making those product pages look really nice and actually make them usable. So we went down the route of Sparklayer because, to be honest, we had to convince a lot of people internally and externally that it was possible to do B2B e-commerce. Um, because it's just so many different uh, suppliers that we work with, retailers that we work with, and there's just so many different needs, different pricing uh, lists, price lists for different people and stuff like that. So I wanted a, to work with a partner that we could do a little thing, because obviously with e-commerce you can do so much clever stuff, but I wanted to do a little thing first. Then it shows the leadership team, yep, this is actually doable, something that we could maybe see ourselves doing even more of. Um, and now we're sort of like adding on bit by bit to the functionality of the site from there. So that's, that's our approach. Mm. Now I think like, like all things, there's, there's two parts to, to successfully doing B2B. One is that you need a certain, you need the functionality. And 
B2B customers do need different functionality. And Alex, maybe just touch on what are the different bits of functionality that a wholesale customer needs on the website compared to a direct-to-consumer site? Typically, it will present itself in um, different product rules uh, for, uh, for your B2B products. For example, you might sell in pack sizes or minimum order quantities and things like that might be needed. Obviously, a different price is one of the key things there as well. Um, each customer might have their own price. I think in Asmodee's case, that's, mm -hmm. that's true. Or you may do it by customer group. Um, and then different payment options are, are typical as well within, within B2B. So um, you may have people who pay on account, you may have people who pay by invoice, uh, they may also pay upfront by card. There's various different options for, for people with payments, but those would probably be the, the, the key three things really that, that people are looking for from a B2B experience. And yesterday, I don't know if any of you saw that there was a really interesting B2B um, talk just in the theater behind here. And I was listening to the, uh, the chap who was um, running it's a sort of car parts business. And one of the things they were saying is that their, their VC and their funding are very much, you've got to get your sales team off being manually processed. If you're gonna grow and scale your business, your customers have to be able to order online. And, but there's a very difficult and interesting balance there between do you just let your customers order or do you manage them through a sales team? And actually the, the reality is you probably need a combination of both. Mm. Yes. Um, and I think the sales agent functionality is quite relevant. I don't know whether either of you guys have got a, a view on how you're going to use the balance of salespeople and technology to maximize everything. Either of you? Yeah, so we're on the motorsport side of things. We're currently selling to wholesale customers just through regular sales agents their margin orders with Excel spreadsheets. Um, one of the biggest challenges they have is everyone likes to edit a spreadsheet when they get it. So when they send the spreadsheet back, every spreadsheet is completely different to how it left out. It means they can't do a simple bulk upload back into our system. So they have to spend hours, if not days, formatting the data just to be able to put into our system. Um, our future plan is to get all those wholesale customers onto this B2B platform, so they're processing orders through Sparklayer. That data's exactly how we need it. Um, we've had a few customers who aren't sure, don't like change. That's where we've had one of our agents use the sales agent feature. Um, there's been occasions where we've completed the entire order for them on the platform, click, uh, click complete, and then they just get the the workflow of emails, your order's been uh, received, um, and then they get the regular dispatch notifications, and then there's the other times we've used the sales agent function. We've got the order in the basket, ask them to log in, they'll check the order and then just click you know, through the payment methods, and then that way you know, that they're seeing how easy it is to complete a purchase without having to go through the journey of discovery of the products on site and adding them to the basket. So. Um, we're able to use that function just to tailor it to each customer's needs. Yeah, yeah it's, um, it's been really helpful because then those customers have reported back to McLaren who then communicated that out to their wider network and said, you know, this, this system's working, we encourage you to use it. Um, so you know, one, one positive interaction with the customer just keeps pushing on to the next one. And Sophie, when we were talking, you've, you know, you, on one hand, Chris is selling to McLaren supercar dealers around the world, giving you know nice key rings to people who've bought incredibly expensive supercars. You've got a very diverse mix. So you're, on one hand, you've got Waterstones. On the other hand, you might have a you know uh, your husband and wife toy shop on a high street somewhere. Yeah. So how do, how are you going to approach the the selling of B two B to such a disproportionate group of people? A lot of it comes down to people's time management. So if you're running a shop by yourself or just with your partner, sometimes you'll have customers in and sometimes you won't. And so it might be that they take that 10 minutes of downtime to quickly place an order. Or some sh shops or game cafes, they're becoming really popular now. And they might open at 11 and stay open until 11. And people want to place those orders after hours. So um, it's been really, really good for that, but also with uh, where it's more of a sophisticated buyer that we're selling to, like Waterstones, the use case that we're planning is sort of building a collection that we can you can send a link straight over. Because with board and card games, um, 
the exclusivity of it is the bit that sells and getting the latest release. And so if you print a product catalog to then physically send out to your customers, it'll be out of date within a month. And so uh, enabling us to make collections and then send those out has been brilliant. As well as with Sparkly, you can do a shopping list. So the customer can put a few things into their basket and save it themselves of things like always reorder these. I'll just save that and it will just you just click it and it goes in. But the sales agent can also make those. So we could do like a hot list for the month and then the customer can automatically add them to their baskets. So that's one step overcome already. And then they can delete things out if they don't think they're as relevant to their customers. So it's a real collaboration tool. Um, and it's also if someone has a conversation, a sales agent with the customer, they can put things into their basket to go log on, have a look later. It's already in there. And it's that one step closer to them going, well, I might as well just press, yep, check out, let's go. <laughs> so that works well. Yeah. Sophie touched on two really good points, actually, that we had a lot of issues with was price lists and inventory. We previously would have to send customers, sorry, we'd previously have to send customers price lists. Okay. If there's any errors on the price list, we have to send out updated sheets. So there can always be like out of date versions of those order forms like in the market and we never know which one we'll get back. Beauty of the B2B site is it's an e-com platform. If we notice a price mistake, we can update it and we don't have to notify customers per se, but it's a live change on site. Same with stock levels and quantities. That's what Sparkletter does really well. You can see those parameters easily. Yeah. I think Sophie touched on another really important point as well, which um, I've noticed with some of our customers is it's really important to know your end customer. And I think some of the things that you're talking about there are, are really, really crucial. But I went to see another one of our customers who sells medical equipment to GPs. Um, and one thing that is completely essential for them uh, and a big differentiator is that they're able to deliver overnight. And what they've realized is that the GP surgeries get to the end of the day and realize like, oh, I've run out of plastic gloves and masks today and I need some more tomorrow. Um, so knowing your customer and the way they buy, the things that are important to them, it doesn't mean that you have to drop all of that just to have a B B2B e-commerce experience. But those two things working hand in hand are, are absolutely key. Um, so not losing sight of the customer, I think, is, is something that these guys have done really well and, and a lot of the other Sparkler customers too. Because I think then as we move on to the future challenges, there's one bit getting the, the functionality into the system that allows you to do it. There's also challenges with adoption, isn't there, I think? Uh, and this is something where I think Sparkler are, are gathering a lot of customer data to provide, able to provide knowledge now because it's... It's one thing getting the features, you've got to get them to use it. And if you've got loads of different people. So how are you thinking about, Chris, getting people to use and get the user adoption up? Yeah, so we're in a bit of a unique situation uh, in that that dealership network's established. They're part partners or franchises of McLaren. So we, we were able to take a, um, advantage of that database. McLaren will send out comms to all of them new products have launched, improvements to the site or deals on there. So we're able to get McLaren to send those emails on our behalf as well as us having that CRM database ourselves. Um, so yeah, that, that's quite a fortunate situation there. And then once we adapt it to the other wholesalers, when we put Mar Brands and Mar Sports on there, um, we'll, just be, we'll have that case study for McLaren and the brands that precede them. So, if you had, how are you going to drive user adoption? Are you going to are you going to force people to buy through the platform? Are you going to encourage them? Are you going to use a transition journey? What do you, how are you going to manage it? I don't. Could I force people? I'm not sure. <laughs> but um, we found so if I had to convince everyone in the business that we are ready to put the time and money into B2B e-commerce before we then did it, I think it would just never ever be done. And so. This is like a way of doing a small part of it. And like I say, you can then do lots of automated marketing and everything else afterwards. But we found like they thought that the website training would take ages when actually you give someone a login and they're like, essentially, if you can use Amazon or if you can use ASOS, you can use it. Like it's that, it's that simple. Um, and just hearing the feedback as well has been really nice because we sell miniatures as well, like the little painted things. and. Customers, like we're not the only distributor that use a e-commerce platform, but other ones you don't typically have pictures and images, and that's really important when you're selling 
goblin left hand something or other or goblin with a sword or without and just having pictures is blowing their minds which is something that if you're a D2C customer you take for granted so I think just getting people to have a go which you can with the sales agent ordering get, get a customer service agent to log in have a go and go oh this is actually really easy and you're like done <laughs> and the next one so it becomes quite addictive and actually uh, slightly on that both of you have said that you had some battles trying to get internal company buy-in to support the B2B journey. Tell yeah. me a bit about that. Yeah, when we started the project, it was so it came from the top down that this is a business priority. We need this platform. We need it now. But we didn't have any additional resource internally. I was really the only person taking ownership of the project. So although it was a business priority, it was never anyone's workflow priority. So trying to get this B2B project across all the teams that need to be involved in it was the biggest challenge. So if I was able to take a, st a step back and do it all again, I'd probably try and map out much more clearly roles and responsibilities for each department. Um, but we didn't have a clear project when we started. It was, if we keep going, it'll turn into something. Um, but really, with hindsight, we should have like, sat down, road mapped it out, and said, we're going to need this input from this person, whereas we approached them at the time we needed them for everything. And then it's just been really difficult to get everyone's buy-in. Um, now, as sales are coming in, things are working. More of those teams and those members are sort of opting in to use it. We're looking at getting more resource to be able to dedicate solely to B2B. So it's slowly becoming its own thing rather than something that's managed by members that belong to other teams now. And Sophie, did you, go, did you have battles trying to get internal support or? Yes, we did. <laughs> <laughs> um, again, I think it was just trying to convince people that it was achievable without having a massive project team and a big budget. Um, and it was, I would agree with you where you just have to sort of get that step-by-step -step thing plotted out really early. But I've learned that people like the idea of talking about an e-commerce site and it's shiny and new and everyone has loads and loads of ideas. But if you don't keep that scope really tight to begin with, it will take you years to develop and you probably will go further towards the bespoke end. Whereas if you want something that works much quicker than that, you need to go, right, we're only going to let it do this. And if someone says, Oh, but we really want this as well. Go, that's a fantastic idea. Thank you so much. We'll put it on the list for when we get this first bit delivered. Um, and that's how we've got it over the line and, and launched it. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, and Alex, in terms of integration times, you'll see a range. But what are you seeing in terms of the range of times it's taking people to, to go from thinking about B2B to being up and running and using it? Um, it really depends on the complexity of the, the business, I guess, and, and what they're looking to achieve. But we see people spin up B2B sites and get going within a day, uh, all the way up to you know a couple of months just to get all of the right integrations in place, the right data sources, and I guess train teams and get internal buy-in and things like that as well. So um, it really is as, as, quick as, as quick as you can go, really, with, with these things, um, with, with SparkPlayer specifically. But I guess, as I said, it, it really depends on the, the level of integration and complexity that that person might have or that co company might have. Yeah, there's, there's definitely a decision about how many different bits of data and connectivity. You were talking about NetSuite and how you feed everything in. So I yeah. think there's some, some thoughts about how you do that. But I guess if we're going to wrap up, because it's, it's a Thursday afternoon, if you were gonna, if there are, if there are retailers, brands out here, which hopefully there are, who are in that journey thinking about what to do, what's the one bit of takeaway advice that you would give them to think about? Yeah, probably that. Probably to pl like plan the project. But if you really are going to struggle to get everyone's buy-in, it really was that simple to integrate. I think we we had the conversation, installed the app, and then the bits of work that Sparklayer needs to do, I think it took a day. And we had all this functionality that we'd been talking with our dev team for months about, and we had this functionality within the space of a day. So if you can't plan it, like ideally plan it. If you can't plan it, just do it. It'll, it'll start happening. Like That was the easiest thing for us. Like As much as I like to plan and have everything laid out, um, it, it was it was better to start and figure out as we went along. Um, 
but we had all that functionality, which was easy to prove that we, we had a viable solution here. Brilliant, thank you. Sophie? Um, my approach, so I joined Asmodee, and it was my first project that I started working on, and it was just relentless optimism, because a lot of people were like, I'll believe it when I see it. And I go, cool, excellent, <laughs> get ready. And, and that's, I, didn't all, I, I did believe it myself, but I knew that it would be quite a hard road at some points, but outwardly to get people's buy-in, I mean, what everyone wanted the e-commerce platform. It was just making people believe it could happen and that you knew enough to get the steps going. And so I found talking in layman's terms, because I'm not massively technical, but I know enough to get the right teams talking to each other and trusting all of them, getting their feedback and, and making their voices feel really valued um, and just try, being overly cheerful to the point of annoyance maybe. <laughs> but it, it got it done. It, if you're a grumpy person, you won't make much change in a business. But I'm going to avoid eye contact with anyone I know now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I should say grumpy people, there's some at the yeah, back. And then, yeah, that's it. And then Alex, what was your um, I think my, my advice is probably almost contrary to, to Chris in a way, but probably almost the same point at the same time. It's have a bit of a plan of what, <laughs> what you want to do. I think Chris got on with it, and, but they had an overarching strategy that they were looking to achieve. And I think I see a lot of customers who install something like Sparklayer or a, another B2B type of system, um, and they don't have an overarching strategy for B2B or a plan for what they are actually going to do to go and drive traffic to that B2B side of the business. You, you don't just install wholesale functionality on your, on your website and suddenly a bunch of retailers come along and start buying from you. Um, it requires a little bit of thought and a little bit of um, uh, care and attention to how you actually drum up some business and, and go out and make that happen. So I think, yes, have the guts to go and do it and, and, and install and, and kick it off, but also have an idea of where you're trying to get to and what kind of steps you need to take to make that actually successful in the long term. Yeah, brilliant. I think finally, a, a comment I would make is that one thing that Sparklayer have done really well is they've created a big blog and knowledge center on the website which has a lot of detail about the functionality that you require and that you need to do and experiences that brands have had, which is entirely relevant whether you decide to use Sparkplayer or not. So if you are thinking about doing it, have a look at that knowledge center and you'll get some really good customer case studies to ha have a read through. So I mean, from my point of view, I'm going to thank the panel for their, uh, for their time and effort today. If anybody does have any questions, you can either ask them now or come up. Yeah, well, OK. I think there's a microphone. Sorry. So. It's working. Our great talk today. Um, what do you think is the future of uh, B2B marketplaces? And do you think that it's going to be one uh, winner take it all, like fair or like bigger guys? Or do you think, do, do you see the mar B2B marketplaces more fragmented across the industries? Um, I, if I'll jump in with, a, yeah. with an answer. I think um, I see a lot of our customers using fair, anchor store, places like that for, for marketplace purposes. Um, and a lot of them use it as an acquisition channel, so they get their, their retail customers through that, through that marketplace, understand who their customer is, um, and then try and migrate them to their own customer where they've got their own website and they're able to control that customer journey. So uh, whether that's the answer or not that you're looking for, I don't know if I've got a crystal ball that can answer about the future of the marketplace specifically, but I see a lot of customers using them in that hybrid approach where you can use it as an acquisition channel and then Perhaps a more cost-effective route is to, is to then continue working with that customer on your own website later on. Do you guys have a view from a retailer perspective? Um, marketplaces is something that we tend to stay away from just because we are selling to retailers, we are selling D to C on our own Shopify stores, so we try not to flood the market in other areas when we're trying to channel them through our, our, our stores. We don't want to be discounting elsewhere in the market either. So we, we are trying to contain it, but that's just our business model. Yeah, probably one step away for us as well. We're kind of keeping it one route at the minute. Excellent. Thank you for the question. Cool. I think you. we have another one at the back. Hi there. Do you find that sometimes your customers do everything self-serve, finally, and then they get to the end of the process, and because they're used to doing things through a person and a salesperson, they, they pick up the phone and say, surely you can do a better deal than anything I've seen on the website? We haven't had that one yet, but maybe I need to make our sales team like <laughs> <laughs> ready for that question. Yeah, no, we don't. We haven't had that yet. It's it's quite um, 
because we're the exclusive supplier for most of our products, but not all of them, it's kind of, they do accept the price as the price. And we don't typically, we have price lists already set, so we don't typically discount. But if they get wins that one person gets that, that's going to open up a whole can of worms. So yeah, I need to be aware of that. It does sound like potentially an upselling opportunity. The, the salesman in me goes, well, then, well, there's always a deal to be done for the right volume. <laughs> And I think maybe that's one of the sales agent functionality that allows the salespeople, if they have flexibility on negotiation, to be able to put in flash discounts to go, well, look, if you were to buy X amount of this old stock that we're trying to flick, I might be able to, or I might be able to give you better payment terms, or I might be able to, and maybe that's where the combination of online self-serve and salesperson thing goes together. She's running. That's such an interesting one, though. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much for the running. Um, in request of focus, so right now, um, what was your initial focus? So did you focus on um, getting rid of uh, internal work, internal stuff, and let's say save all the resources there and the mandates of Excel work? Or is the focus more on client perspective, go into the shop, have a good customer experience, maybe upsell, marketing? So. How do you see it? Do you have sales goals from that perspective, or do you have um, internal, whatever, gross profit, saving goals? So what is your focus there? Like I internal focus versus like customer focus and the experience. Did, which one did you prioritize more, I think, is, is the question. Um, I, I think we, we initially focus on the customer experience first, make sure that the we're trying to reteach everyone from using spreadsheets and completing orders through spreadsheets. So, one of the things on the Spark layer interface is that on their product list page, all you can order all sizes of all colors of a product, you know, without leaving like the collection page. Instead of like an, on an e-com store going into each product and then coming back out. So, that was really important to us that. The e-com site kind of felt like ordering on a spreadsheet, but it was also familiar like using any other e-com store. And, and then internally, we had to make sure that as many of those processes, uh, you know, pushing orders through from Shopify, through to NetSuite, through to our warehouse, that those parts of the, of the process are automated. Using the spreadsheet method, each step had to have human intervention. So by automating all those processes, actually freed up our sales agents to focus on the customers that they're currently having to do. So we've actually been able to get them to buy in as we've managed to automate a lot of processes. We've still, we've still found opportunities for other processes to automate. Uh, the next one that we're automating is um, fully automating the invoicing solution. At the moment, there's a few steps of human intervention. Once we automate that, again, we, we think that, that that's going to save a lot of time. And one of the things that our customers like the most is that there's the customer account section where you can see your previous orders and your PDF invoices there. So that becomes a self-service platform. People aren't you know, emailing our agents saying, can I get my invoice? Or I didn't get the email. They know that they can check that platform, and that's really reduced the amount of customers that are reaching back out to us. Yeah. Um, I think for for me, I I took a really simple approach to it because we have so many different customers that have quirky ways of ordering things in special things, and I think that's what stopped us from doing e-commerce prior to me joining us with it was because they wanted a solution that fit every single customer and all their wonderful ways of ordering. And so I said, I want our customer to be able to go online, check what the inventory levels are and place an order and to be able to see that volume discount and stuff like that. And so the thing I've repeated a lot is it's for the majority of our customers and for the majority of our products, but it's not for every single product or maybe not yet. And we might be able to do things where certain products where we have like maximum order quantities per SKU and everything like that. Do that later. I just want, that is what I want to achieve first and that will solve our biggest problem of where we've grown a lot. We need to be able to get our customers self-serving because the amount of time they're having to wait for their orders to go through at the moment, I'm like, that's just not okay. Like it needs to be faster. So yeah, I, I, went, I went that way first and then I had to sort of 
to the other people internally going, yeah, but what about this customer or what about this product? I go, I hear that and we'll totally get to that. But right now we're just focusing on this big part over here. And that's how I kind of, I suppose I did force change management in some ways, but I had to, so yeah. I think that they're sort of in a cyclical link, aren't they? Because if the internal stuff is too cumbersome, you can't scale anyway, so the growth will kill it. Perfect. So you sort of have to get that right in order to get the sales. But then it, if if it's not proper in the first place, you won't get the growth. So they, they, need, they need to be a flywheel. Thanks. Right, well, thank you for some fabulous questions. Uh, we will be around if anybody wants to ask anything more. The Spark Layer st uh, stand is over there somewhere. So uh, lovely to meet you all. Thank you for your time on this Thursday afternoon and thank you very much. And thank you to the panel. Thank you. Thank you.